to come at your feet to be taught and instructed. I pray that let the teaching be under the influence of your spirit and breath. Let it not be in the wisdom of man. In Jesus' name I prayed. Praise the Lord. We have been on a series on false prophets. We started with unmasking last day's false prophets. Last week, when I came to the danger of fraternity with false prophets, Today, we shall be looking at Christ's displeasure as false doctrines. Because this false prophet, one of their tools is their doctrines, which the Bible describes as doctrines of devils. And God is not happy when his children... Go into error and swallow hook, line, and sinker what these Lucifer's disciples are propagating. Look at Revelation chapter 2 in verse 14. Christ's displeasure at false doctrines. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold, when he say hold, that believe, that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling before or a block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I ate. Jesus Christ said, He, hold, he hates those that hold the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. What is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? It is a false doctrine. This Nicolai, Nicolaitans doctrine is a doctrine that emerged from Nicholas. Let's look at, uh, we'll, come back, we'll come to our text. Let's look at Acts chapter 6. From where that doctrine of Nicolai times originated from. It originated from one of the seven deacons. You see, we need to be very, very careful. Anybody can slip into error. And don't say, oh, that man, he has, he has been my spiritual father. But what is he teaching now? What is he propagating? In Acts chapter 6, let me read verse, verse, um, verse 6. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is no reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report. Mark you. This Nicholas was a man of honest report before. Full of what? The Holy Ghost and wisdom. Whom we may appoint over this business. Look at verse 5. And the same pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And Philip and uh, Prochorus and Nicanor. And Timon and Parmenas and U Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. 
This Nicholas later began to teach error. He began to teach sheep grace. And people now hold that doctrine. And Christ said, I eat that. Somebody could start very well. But what the person is teaching, if it is contrary to sound doctrine, Christ eat eats. He ate all forms of doctrine, false doctrine rather, and said he was going to fight those that hold that kind of doctrine with the sword of his mouth. <laughs> Who can withstand the sword of Christ? If only his breath. Because the Bible says that Christ will destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming and with the breath of his mouth. Then is sword. Nobody can withstand that. So destruction await all who hold on to false doctrine. Not only those that are teaching it, even those that believe and follow them in their falsehood stand in danger of being destroyed by Christ. Christ did not say he was going to leave that to angels. He said, I will destroy. You know, some people say, Jesus loves. Yes, I am so glad Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. But, Jesus is no longer coming as the loving Savior. is coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah is coming as the captain of the armies of heaven to destroy those that have trampled the truths on their feet. We are going to look at this teaching from Terry perspective. Number one, characterization of false doctrines. When we say characterization, what and what constitute false doctrine? Then, if somebody holds on to false doctrine, it has consequences. So, that would take us to the second part of the teaching, consequences of false doctrines. Then, how can we curtail? That brings us to curtailing false doctrines. The first, what and what can we say constitute false doctrine? Number one, when somebody teach that the Bible has error and that the Bible is not reliable, somebody denying the infallibility an inherency of the Bible, that person is perpetrating false doctrine. Look at Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter chapter three, verse sixteen. Second Peter three sixteen. As also in all his epistles. Speaking in them of those things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that unlearned and unstable rest, as they also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. When people rest the scripture, they dispute the scripture, and they they try to downplay the scripture. It is false doctrine. Or when somebody says that the Bible is not inspired word of God, 
that is falsehood and false doctrine. Because the Bible says that in um, Second Timothy chapter three, sixteen, seventeen. Second Timothy three, sixteen, seventeen. That person say, no, there are some part of the Bible that are not inspired. No. That person is removing from the world and is a false apostle that what is teaching constitute false doctrine. In Second Timothy 3, 16, all scripture, mark that word. It didn't say some. It say all scripture is given by who? By inspiration of God. That word inspiration means breath of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly funny unto all good world. So the word of God is complete. And if somebody says the word of God is incomplete, that is false doctrine. Look at Revelation. Chapter 22, Revelation 22, Revelation 22, in verse 18. For I testify unto every man that hear the words of this prophecy, of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the place that are written in this book. When somebody had to the Bible, what is not there? For instance, some people bring in infant baptism. Baptism of the dead. All those are false doctrine. If any man Add unto this thing. God shall add unto him the place that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the word of the book of this prophecy, taking away from the word of God is also false doctrine. Because the Bible says in Psalm 19, verse 7, let's open to Psalm 19, in verse 7, which says, Let us fear the Bible. No, when I say fear, in, in other words, let us tremble before His word and don't do anything to undermine the authority of the word. Because the Bible says, God even honors His word more than all His name. In uh, Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is what? Perfect. The Bible says the word of God is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Look at um, verse 10. More to be desired are they than go, yea, than much fine go, sweeter also than honey, the honeycomb. So, and then another thing that constitutes false doctrine is cheapening, or what the Bible calls perverting the gospel of grace. Look at Galatians chapter 1 in verse 7. Galatians chapter 1 verse 7. When you say you pervert, when you distort the great gospel of grace and to accommodate unrighteous living and say the grace of God covers that. That is false doctrine. Look at what Paul said in Galatians chapter 1 verse 7. Galatians 1 verse 7. Let me read from verse 6. I marvel that ye are so so removed from him that called you on into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. How do they pervert this gospel of Christ? Look at how Jude put it. Jude 1 verse 4. Jude 1 in verse 4. They pervert the gospel of Christ through licentious evil sexual living. In Jude 1 4, 
For there are certain men crept in on our world who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the Lord Jesus, the Lord God and our Lord Jesus. Another thing that we can say is for doctrine is replacing the Bible with commandments and traditions of men. In uh, Matthew 15, where is 6 and 9, some things that churches bring for administrative purpose, when those things over time begin to now replace the Bible, that is false doctrine. In Matthew 15, I read verse 6. Matthew 15, verse 6. And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. In verse 9. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandment of men, not the commandment of God. That is false doctrine. Then, now, you have churches and so-called men of God that says you can divorce your wife and remarry. That is false doctrine. One of them remarried and later that one too did not work. He said it's now a celibate. Now God said he is a celibate that he has been disobeying him. Divorce and remarriage is false doctrine. Look at what Jesus Christ said in Matthew 19:9. Matthew 19:9. Matthew 19 verse 9. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committed adultery, and whoso married her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. Well, some people say, okay, if my wife commit adultery now, I can divorce her. You know, there is what is called plenary inspiration. In other words, the words, because the Bible says, only men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Yes, they use, God used words that the authors were familiar with, but the words themselves are inspired. So here, he say, except it be for fornication, Fornication and adultery are two different things. Married people don't commit fornication, but they commit what? Adultery. You know, in Israel at that time, they do what is called betrothed. Betro- betro- they betrothed. You know, Joseph and uh, Mary. Jo- uh, Mary was betrothed to Joseph. So, if not the, the child that was with Mary was of the Holy Ghost, we could say that Mary had committed fornication. So at that time, Joseph could pull out of the marriage. That's what the Bible is talking about. It's not saying that when people have come together, then when one party commits her daughter, then you push her away. All that you were looking for on the ground. Bible say, except we be for adultery. Did it say, except for adultery? It said, except for what? Fornication. Then, if you look at the word, the way the words are used, let's look at it. I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except we be for fornication, and shall marry another, does what? Commit adultery. The person that is marrying another, what? Commit adultery. So, this prosperity gospel we have in the land is not of God. Yes, like I did say last week, 
God said, I wish above the all things that thou may have prosper and be in earth, even as thy soul prosper. But now, prosperity gospel, some people say, if you are a believer, and you say you are a believer, and you are not prospering, then check your Christian life. That is satanic. That is not of God. Lazarus, was he not a believer? Was he prosperous? No. God's wish is that we prosper about certain circumstances can play out. It does not mean that that person is a believer. So it means that they say every believer is supposed to be prosperous. God said the poor hmm? and the stranger will not cease in the land. There is no automatic prosperity. There are some things that come into play. He said, I will bless the work of what? Your hand. If somebody is in this life, he does not have any skill, any trade, they didn't have any certificate, he's not using his brain, God is not a magician. He said, I will bless the work of your hand. So, when people now begin to say, Oh, when you are not prospering, they, they equate godliness with gain. Look at the First Timothy chapter 6, verse 5. First Timothy chapter 6, in verse 5. But the perverse disputings of men of corrupt mind, those things are perverse. About Perverse dispute of corrupt mind and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is what godliness. No, gain is not godliness. Bible says, From source, do what withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is what great gain. You know, God was talking to this church. One of the churches in Revelation, he said, I know thy poverty. He said, but thou art what? Rich. He said, you are rich. Physically, you are poor. So does that mean that church was not of God? So anybody that holds that uh, a believer that is not prospering means that his Christian life is questionable, that is a false doctrine. And then, those who deny the lordship of Christ, they are perpetrating false doctrine. That Jude we say, we read say, they even deny the lordship of of the Lord and even our Christ. That Jude one four, the last part, and denying the only Lord and our Lord Jesus. They say Jesus is not law. Then there are those who claim that and teach. When they are teaching, they teach it with all vehemence. They teach that the gift of the Spirit ceases with the apostles. It's very, especially if you go to some of these Western churches. America, some of these places, some pastors with t- because they lack power, they want to hide under error to say that the apostolic gifts are not for our generation, that they seize with the early church, with the apostles. But when Paul was writing about the gift of the Spirit, let's look at what he said. In uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. To seven. First Corinthians twelve, verse four to seven. Now there are diversity of gifts, but the same spirit, and there are differences of administration, but the same Lord, and there are diversity of pressure, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Verse seven. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to all every man to profit with her. He didn't say is given to the apostles. That is error. Some deny the resurrection of the dead. They say it's not possible. How can the dead rise? Look at Second Timothy chapter two, 
verse 17 and 18. Second Timothy 2, 17. And their word we eat as doth a canker, of whom is Emmanuel and the Philetus, who concerning the truth have heard, they have heard, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrew the feet of some. Those who dispute the possibility of living a holy and sanctified life. They say it's not possible for any man to live above sin. But the Bible says in First uh, John chapter three, verse nine, he that committed sin is war of the devil. Let me read from that first John chapter three. I read from verse uh, verse four. First John. 3 verse 4 they say no man can live a holy life we are in a dirty society we are all sinners that can't live above sin nobody can be free from sin bible say he that committed sin is the servant of sin look at first john chapter 3 verse 4 whosoever committed sin transgress also the law for sin is the transgression of the law and ye know that it was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin whosoever abided in him sinneth not whosoever sinneth hath not seen him neither known him little children let no man deceive you he that doeth righteousness is righteous even as is righteous he that committed sin is of the devil for the devil sinned from the beginning for this purpose the son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil whosoever is born of God doth not commit what sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God then those that teach that we are no more in bondage and that because we have, have liberty we, uh, whatever you do one so called uh, great man of God in this nation was teaching that anything you do is not sin you can't turn sin Bible says you cannot sin in other words whether you commit uh, fornication God does not see as sin you are born again they teach that and many people hide under that. On the last day, God will not say because you, uh, it was this one that deceived you. You are the Bible with you. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Galatians chapter 5, in verse 13. Galatians 5, 13. Brethren, these doctrines are all over the place. Let me first of all reverse verse 5, verse 1 this is where they hide under Galatians 5 verse 1 stand fast therefore in the liberty where with Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage, they stop there they don't proceed, look at verse 13 for brethren ye have been called unto liberty only use not liberty for an occasion to what? to the flesh but by love serve one another. If somebody is living, is, is an adherent of false teaching, what are we with the person? One, that's bring us to the consequences. Number one, the person is perverting the gospel of God. That's what we saw in uh, Galatians 1 7. Then, because the person is perverting the gospel of God, grace, he has fallen from grace. He will be graceless. Look at that, Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. Galatians 5, 4. Christ is become of no effect to you, whosoever of you is justified by the law. Ye are falling from grace. That person has fallen from grace. Galatians 3, 3. Galatians 3, 3. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? There's no more grace. They are living in the flesh. False doctrine deceives people. In uh, 2 Timothy, 
chapter 3 verse 13 second timothy chapter 3 in verse 13 but evil men and seducers shall wax, wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived it pollutes it brings into spiritual bondage galatians chapter 2 verse 4 somebody who believes false doctrine is first polluted because jesus christ said they those that hold the doctrine of balaam and that taught balak to and te- and teaching the people of god to commit fornication and things offered to idols then spiritual pollution will bring in bondage Galatians chapter 2 verse 4 Galatians 2 4 they are under satanic bondage and that because of false brethren and words brought in who came in privilege to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage false doctrines leads to backsliding that uh, second timothy chapter 2 17 and 18 that we read said they have the false doctrine has overthrown the feet of many that brings divine displeasure and wrath and eventually it will bring eternal destruction in the lake of fire how do we get out of this web of false doctrine curtailing false doctrines number one thing is to examine ourselves examine what we have believed the the things you hold on to bring them in the light of the scripture and if you discover that you are holding on to a doctrine, a belief that is not scriptural, you need to first repent because it is sin. You repent and renounce. Jesus Christ told them they should repent. Then Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, he said they have renounced the eating works of darkness then after renouncing them you separate from the false teachers that cost you to believe error bible says in um, romans 16 17 it says mark them which cause division and offenses Contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and do what? Avoid them. You must shut your ears from every false doctrine. You know, Paul said, he said, we didn't give them space for one second. In Galatians 2, verse 5, he says, some people, they know that this person is a false teacher, but they are still listening to him. <laughs> You are treading a dangerous path. Galatians chapter 2 verse 5. To whom we gave space by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. You need to then search the scriptures and get grounded in the scriptures. Bible says in John 8 32, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall what? Set you free. Then if you have materials, whether books or audio, video contents that contain false doctrine, you destroy them. When the believers had the word in Acts 19, let's look at Acts 19, verse 9. 
verse 19. Acts 19, let's read 18, 19. And many that believe came and confessed and showed their deeds. And many of them also which used curious arts. Curious arts, like all those occultic materials, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. They burned them. Then... You must be filled with the Spirit of God. Because if you lack the Spirit of God, you can easily be derailed. Jesus Christ said, He will send the Comforter, and when He is come, He will guide you into all truths. Be filled with the Spirit. John, the beloved, told us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, He said, He the auction, the anointing you have, teach you. It teaches you. You need to strive to be filled. Then stay under the ministry of God's anointed ministers. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 14. Remain under the teaching of ministers of God that are anointed so that you will not be caught in the web and the error of this last day. In uh, Ephesians 4 verse 11 And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the defying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the faith of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slit of men and corny craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You must also abide in Christ. Jesus Christ said, without me, he can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, is Men gather them and they are born. And if you don't abide, you begin to wander from one or place to the other. Bible says, either wandereth from the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. You must watch and be prayerful. Don't feel that you cannot be deceived. You must always watch and pray. Jesus Christ said, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Brethren, false doctrines are all over the place. You must run away from them. You must remain in the truth. Anything you know that is false. Do away with it. And any agent that is propagating that falsehood have no fellowship with them. Let's rise up and go to the Lord in prayers. Ask the Lord to deliver you from every wind of false doctrine. Examine yourself. If there is any way you know that you are believe error, repent and renounce that error.